IHSS Advocates, improving the developmentally disabled community, one family at a time, proudly presents Episode 3, How to Establish That Your Non-Self-Directing and Mentally Impaired Child is Likely to Engage in Potentially Dangerous Activities. Hello, my name is Larry Rosen. I am a partner in the advocacy firm IHSS Advocates. Today I am discussing how to establish that your non-self-directing and mentally impaired child is likely to engage in potentially dangerous activities. This task is step two of the four-step process of assessing children for protective supervision. ACL 1525 states, If the minor is mentally impaired, mentally ill, and non-self-directing, is he, she likely to engage in potentially dangerous activities? Consider here whether the minor retains the physical ability to put him, herself, at risk of harm. If the answer is no, then the minor is not eligible for protective supervision under the Calderon v. Anderson court decision, and protective supervision should not be granted. The county should document that because the child is not likely to engage in potentially dangerous activities, the minor does not meet the Garrett criteria of needing more supervision than another minor of the same age without a mental impairment, mental illness. MPP 30-757.17 states in part, Protective supervision consists of observing recipient behavior and intervening as appropriate in order to safeguard the recipient against injury, hazard, or accident. MPP 30-757.172 subsection B adds, Protective supervision shall not be authorized when the need is caused by a medical condition and the form of the supervision required is medical. Protective supervision recipients must be physically capable of harming themselves. In Calderon v. Anderson, the court held that the plaintiff was not entitled to protective supervision under the IHSS program because his physical condition made it impossible for him to engage in any activities that would require observation or preventative intervention and protective supervision was not available merely to provide constant oversight in anticipation of environmental or medical emergencies. However, a mentally impaired or mentally ill individual who is bedridden or in a wheelchair is not necessarily incapable of engaging in activities that would require observation or preventative intervention under protective supervision. The specific factual circumstances of the individual must be considered when determining whether she or he has the physical ability to engage in potentially dangerous activities. For example, a mentally impaired, mentally ill, bedridden individual may still have the physical ability to pull at his or her G-tube that requires observation or intervention under protective supervision. The risk of harm is different than the types of medical emergencies, medical conditions for which protective supervision is not available under MPP 30-757.172, such as the potential to fall because the mentally impaired, mentally ill person experiences poor balance. So what types of behaviors are considered potentially dangerous? The best place to look for examples is in California case law. For example, in Nora Singh v. Lightborn, it states, Protective supervision is available for those IHSS beneficiaries who are non-self-directing and that they are unaware of their physical or mental condition and therefore cannot protect themselves from injury and who would most likely engage in potentially dangerous activities. Prior cases analyzing the availability of protective supervision have listed examples of potentially dangerous conduct for which supervision may be authorized, including playing with matches, immersing electrical appliances in water, wandering away from home, cooking, smoking a cigarette, 
and engaging in self-destructive behaviors such as temper tantrums and headbanging against the wall. However, pursuant to CDSS regulation, protective supervision is only available for observing the behavior of non-self-directing, confused, mentally impaired, or mentally ill persons only. Thus, it cannot be authorized when the need is caused by a medical condition and the form of the supervision required is medical. It is CDSS policy that a person does not have to suffer actual injury to be eligible for protective supervision, but only have a history of a propensity for placing him herself in danger. For example, a person with a documented history of non-self-direction, who has a tendency to open the front door and start walking away, does not necessarily have to make it into the street in order for this to be considered potentially hazardous behavior. Documentation supporting the need for protective supervision due to the active participation in potentially dangerous behavior can be collected from many sources. Doctors can fill out IHSS forms, such as the Assessment of Need for Protective Supervision, otherwise known as SOC 821, discussing the mentally impaired child's potentially dangerous behavior. A parent can keep a journal of their mentally impaired child's potentially dangerous behavior. IEP, Regional Center, and Therapist reports relating to the mentally impaired child can be reviewed for examples of potentially dangerous behavior. If needed, treating clinicians and or school personnel can provide eyewitness examples of the mentally impaired child's potentially dangerous behavior. Establishing that your non-self-directing and mentally impaired child is likely to engage in potentially dangerous activities is step two in a four-step assessment process in the granting of protective supervision benefits. We will discuss step three in our next installment.